Good afternoon. This is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. I want to thank you all for carving time out of your day to join us for February's monthly Living with ALS Educational Topic Call webinar. As you may know, this is a monthly series of webinars bringing information of a practical nature to people living with ALS. It being February, and February is often a time when we turn our attention to relationships, our focus is going to be on maintaining those relationships during a journey with ALS. Our guest speaker is, um, well, before I introduce her, let me take a moment to address some housekeeping comments. Uh, number one, this recording certainly is recorded and it will be placed on our ALS Association site for your convenience in listening to this and accessing it post live presentation. I also ask that if you have questions or comments, please submit them to the chat box. We've allocated some time at the end of the presentation to review those. So again, if you have questions or comments, please uh, post those to the chat box and we will review them with the entire audience. And now I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Rebecca Axline is a licensed clinical social worker with 40 years experience providing clinical and managerial social work services to clients in a range of settings, including schools, military bases, and hospice settings. In these settings, she provides program development and clinical interventions with a focus on supporting patients and families and assisting them with coping with the stress associated with neurological diagnoses and treatment. Since 2006, Ms. Axline has been managing the outpatient social work services at the Houston Methodist Neurological Institute, where she's part of the ALS Team HOPE and NANCE National Alzheimer's Center. Uh, Rebecca, I believe you are on the line and have your slides available. Good afternoon. I am so honored to be asked to present this information today. While I've been a clinical social worker for over 40 years, as Cynthia mentioned, and have been with the ALS Team Hope at Houston Methodist for 15 years, much of what I will talk to you about today comes from the experiences and words of you and so many like you who have lived with and cared for someone who lives with the diagnosis of ALS. This is one specific perspective, my perspective, gleaned from touching space with individuals like yourself. I would like to start by clarifying or defining what relationships we might have in our lives. This is not an exhaustive list, yet a good start. Family of origin, I use to define by our family we were born into, or if we were adopted, both our biological and adoptive families. Family of creation is usually defined as our spouse, partner, any children, grandchildren, extended family. We could argue that this might include the Aunt Sallies who weren't really blood relatives, but close family friends we treated as family. But as you can see, it could get a bit complicated. Friends are a bit different than acquaintances because it's often based on trust, closeness, feeling safe to confide, yet friends can often be loosely used. Community means something unique to each of us. It may include our town, our neighborhood, state, church, other civic organizations, even the military. And I include treatment team in our relations because I'm talking for this specific talk about our ALS specialists. It can also include your primary care physician. Since we only have an hour and I want to leave time for questions, these are the main topics for my talk. Safe containers for emotions and grief. Communication is more than words. Roles and behaviors. Resources for education and support. Please know that I would never disrespect you to say that I know that what each of you are experiencing, but for the purposes of support, here are the things that I often see as changes in one's relationship with others. 
Communication changes. While each person's experience is unique, there is often a paradigm shift in how a person living with ALS fits into his or her new world. Their world has changed forever, while perhaps some people around them continues on as if nothing has happened. Some individuals deal with cognitive changes, ranging from subtle executive changes, like difficulty making quick or decisions, to a major change in how they function in the world and perform tasks of daily life. Roles in the relationships with others may change in subtle or remarkable ways. The boss may be now on disability. The mother may need her children to help her in the home. The spouse may have difficulty managing the finances, household chores. The father may have difficulty hugging his family members. The community leader may have to give up his or her beloved duties. I truly believe no matter what the changes are or how others respond to them, respect is a key. We all need to feel purpose in our life and feel that we have a vital difference in a role in this world. We need to have a fit in how we live and we need to be able to be involved in decision-making, even if in only in a small way. And safety is a priority. I know you hear about this all the time, but it's so important. Safety, safety, safety. Whether it's in falls, in breathing, in being alone, it's, pri it's just so important to make sure that you honor your own safety and those of others. And while all of this is happening, part of respect and safety is honoring our own and others' emotions and grief. Grief is about all kinds of changes. It is not just about death. It is about pandemics and mask wearing, about changes in our finances. It is about not being able to run marathons anymore, or perhaps even walk to the mailbox, or not being able to hug our arms tightly around someone. Honoring our grief frees us from shame and frees us from discounting that it, grief is not part of who we are. It allows us to be vulnerable and allows those around us to feel safe to be vulnerable as well. So as we talk about role changes and managing our relationships, I really think it's important to talk about care fatigue. This includes not only the people caring for someone with ALS, but the person himself. All in our lives who provide physical care, emotional support, even financial support. Educating ourselves about what is available and perhaps what is not will allow us to be realistic, hopeful, and proactive all at the same time. I often tell families or encourage them to bring in care helpers early, not because you need it so much as it will allow you to keep the roles and relationships you have as wife, husband, parent, child, and it also allows the person living with ALS to start building trust with a larger group of individuals. During this pandemic, this has become even more difficult and the isolation and fear of hiring others has made the stress and fatigue even more pronounced. And even with extra help, I am just gonna say it out loud, ALS sucks and allowing ourselves to be mad at this disease rather than at each other can help us have the intimate relationships with those we love and even those we just tolerate. We all need to care for ourselves and the word self-care, that term has been way overused and yet each of us are responsible for setting our own boundaries and finding ways to replenish ourselves, giving ourselves permission to take care of ourselves emotionally, physically and mentally. And in that way, we are honoring our grief. So as we talk about grief, can I say in discussion about insurance and care needs and having realistic expectations, there is, it's, it's just goes on and on. There are people on this webinar, I believe from different areas and locations. So the main caveat I would encourage is to accept and ask for help from others. That's easier said than done. 
ask for help and, and offer and accept the help from others. Be creative with the money you have and ask questions. At the same time, understanding that there will never be enough resources for the level of care needed for this terrible disease. That's realism. And again, this is a picture of Houston where I am. But many locations and states and areas have more resources, some have less. It's important that you research and ask, even if you think you already know the answers to the question, ask. Because having care resources does impact our relationships on a day-to-day -day basis. Just one clinical suggestion as a counselor, our being angry and frustrated over something we have no control over, we know it increases our cortisol levels and increases and, and affects our body and robs us of our moments with the people we love. What I encourage people to do, and I try to do it myself, is fight the battles. Yes, including Elsa, who is a strong proponent of fighting the battles. Yet be willing to let go of the angst for those things you can't control. This segues us into a brief discussion on emotions and how they affect our relationships. I am sure that most everyone on this webinar are very aware of what we call pseudo bulbar affective disorder, the inability to control our tearfulness, our crying, and it's based on the neurological disease, not on our own emotions and how it is very different from clinical depression. That being said, people can have both. They can have a pseudobulbar affective disorder and they can have a reactive depression, basically a feeling of sadness, grief, emotions, and emotional reaction to something that has changed and happening in your world. I will just strongly encourage you to talk about it. Talk about it to your physicians, to your clinical folks, especially if you have a social worker, psychologist on your team, because oftentimes people live in silence. Uh, people around them, the people they love, know that they're not, it isn't about not coping well, it's about your whole world has changed and you're grieving and you're stuck in those moments and they're in your head. And in order to get help, it's important to be able to reach out to others and talk about it and again, not feel shamed because it's a part of our being humanness. Every bit of our emotions are part of who we are, both good and bad. It's important to um, seek out information. Insurance will cover talk therapy and the research indicates that medication without counseling is not as effective as both. If you or you, your loved one you feel is going through some depression, again, talk about it because medication can be helpful, but talk counseling can even, talk therapy can even be more valid. And those with communication issues can use their devices and other means to still get that support. And nowadays during this time of pandemic, most therapists are doing telehealth, so it can be done in a safety from your own home. Not everything in life has a pill to fix it. You already know that, I don't need to tell you that. But there are ways to at least help you and talk about how you're feeling. Since we're talking about talking, communicating, let me put that a different way. This leads us to a brief discussion on what I call difficult conversations. ALS is still defined as a terminal disease even though we have individuals living longer and longer and having greater and greater quality of life while they are alive. It is not the Lou Gehrig's of the 1930s, but practical discussions are important at any age and especially when there might be cognitive changes that affect one's ability to tell us what he or she wants in life or how they define quality of life. What I often tell people when I first meet them is to use a silly analogy of the alphabet. You're here in A, B, and C, but if we're honest, we all look at X, Y, and Z in our lives. So do that, take care of business, 
put together your will, your power of attorney, your medical power of attorney. Talk to your loved ones so that then you can go back and live in the rest of your alphabet. No one wants to live in X, Y, and Z. So if you take care of business and communicate with those that you love, you can go back and be fully in those moments that we have in the rest of our lives. Having that short, serious discussion about your choices at the end of life are, even if you might change your mind and make sure everyone knows, it's important that you tell not just your spouse or medical power of attorney, tell everyone so that everyone is on the same page with how to respect and honor your wishes and talk about that and frame it in a conversation that allows you to move past what I call the funky sadness that happens when we have talks, whether it's about end of life or it's about finances or it's about sexual orientation. What happens is we often get in those moments and we don't know how to kind of get out of it. So everybody sits around kind of waiting for someone to uh, break the mood or break the silence. So if you use the analogy of a framing and you say, we're gonna, I really like to talk about for the next 15 minutes, such and such. And then after that, we're all gonna watch a movie or we're all gonna take a walk or we're all gonna have something to eat or have a cup of coffee. Then when you get to that point where everybody's kind of silent, we can say, okay, now we're done with the talk. Let's go do the next thing. Then it's also important to tell your treatment plan what your wishes are so that we can make sure that you have all the correct documents for your state. In Texas, there's what we call an out-of-hospital DNR, which is totally different from a medical power of attorney advanced directive. So it's important to talk about things to your treatment team so that they know how best to support and honor your wishes. And again, even if they change, there's no decision that you make that can't be changed if you have a different way of thinking or way of feeling that you then want to talk about. So after that difficult conversation, let's take a moment and breathe to the best of our ability. And I'm going to read out loud words by a renowned psychologist and author, Harriet Lerner. She's written many books called The Dance of Anger, The Dance of Intimacy, a lot about communication. Anxiety is extremely contagious, but so is calm. This has been a year of anxiety, but we've also learned ways that we can calm ourselves through mindfulness, through talking and breathing, through getting support from others, through doing things on technology like we're doing here, support to know that we're not in this journey alone. It's important to continue to do that as you seek information and ask for others to help you in this, in this process. So you have been so kind to listen to me ramble on and on. And as usual, I talk much faster than I think I'm going to. So I'm gonna take a couple minutes to go over what we talked about and then leave lots of times for question and conversation about what we've talked about. February is a wonderful month to remember relationships and wonder, remember the people that we love. It's also a wonderful break in what we know as winter to kind of think about, as Cynthia mentioned to me earlier today, the spring is coming and new birth and new, and new moments. And it's important to, to do that as we think about the thoughts to consider. Stressors and ALS and challenges of this disease, disease excuse me, are real. As I mentioned before, and many of our families will say this, ALS sucks. We know the stressors and challenges are real. But no matter what each of our life experiences are, we know that relationships are also a vital part of a full life. Here are a few quotes that I just, just happened to think of. One, one was from a 90-year-old woman in a nursing home. And she said, if I had to do it all over again, I would eat more ice cream. Another one was from Zig Ziglar, a motivational speaker who said, without love, 
there is no grief. In other words, in order to have the real rich experiences in life and have relationships, we have to understand that grief may be part of the process. It may not be one that we want, but it is part of life. And I think in our country, in our society, we talk a lot about birth and we talk a lot about living, but we know honestly that death is a part of each person's life that we encounter in this world, including our own. So it's important to know that without love, there is no grief. Also, and I don't remember who said this, but I remember this quote, no one on their deathbed thinks they should have worked harder or longer. Family is everything. Relationships are everything. Of course, that reminds me of a total another quote about fishing, which says that the worst day of fishing is better than the best day at work. Sorry, I just had to put that one in there. So we need each other. Whatever higher power or God you believe in, we are designed to be in relationships to each other. We need each other. We've learned that especially this last year, but all of you living with ALS and caring for someone with ALS have known this long before the pandemic started. No man is an island entire of itself. Everyone is a continent, a piece of the main. That was E.E. E. Cummings. We are all part of the part of the main. So I encourage you while we're discovering new treatments for ALS, we're advocating for better benefits and getting the best care possible. Let's try to live in all our moments, ones of sadness and ones of joy. Because if we're really honest, each of our lives, even before the time of ALS, have had those balances. We've had years where we've had wonderful moments of joy, but we've also had sadness. We see the birth of a baby and we, and we mourn the, the loss of a loved one. Those all come in the same time. All our emotions are part of who we are. And I think it's really important to understand that they're a part of who we are and the relationships we have with each other. And if we're in relationships with each other and our families, we know that we're all gonna have different ups and downs. So maybe one day I'm up and you're down, so I support you. And the next day it happens differently or the next week. And if we're both down, then it's okay to have a down day and to have some extra ice cream or get in bed and do nothing or watch Netflix or whatever it is that's comfort for us, as long as we don't do it for the next month or two, as long as we remember to get up and start moving again and start doing the things that we find enjoyable. And if the ways that have worked for us in the past don't work for us now because of ALS, then it's important to discover and explore for newer ways. I, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but I have met so many individuals who have decided that they had to kind of take back control of their life and do other things to uh, enhance their relationships. Whether it was in creatively learning how to get hugs from others, it was in learning how to write a book about their experiences or give back through the ALS Association or do fundraising or do support, things to make a difference. And when you do those things together and you do those things as a relationship, you are enhancing the love and the support you have for each other. And you're also making moments of joy and nobody can take those moments of joy from you. So on this screen, I've just added a few additional resources. Of course, you know, the ALS Association is a wealth of resources. This is only one, but you know, all their fact sheets and additional things they have on their website are wonderful in these webinars. Dr. Mark Brackett is at um, Harvard and does a lot of work on the power of emotions and the way we can express and learn better how to open up about our emotions. Um, and this book, there's also a couple of websites that might be fun to explore. You may already know about Dagmar Munn, who does a wonderful blog spot and has done several articles for, again, for ALSA and MDA both, um, and is living with ALS herself. She's a dynamic. Uh, blogger and just a wonderful woman. And she'll tell you that one of her claim to fame is her father 
uh, develop the uh, modern day trampoline. So uh, I think that's a wonderful little tidbit of, of trivia. Grief resources, I just put grief.com. It's a free resource. Again, you may not need it at this point, but it is a good resource for dealing with just ways of expressing our emotions. And David Kessler uh, worked alongside Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who wrote the stages of grief and loss. And Wonders and Worries is a resource for parents who um, have children um, who are coping with their own parents' disease. And um, I know ALSA and NDA both do wonderful things working with children as well, but this is just one additional resource. So thank you for your attention. Um, Cynthia, I'm sorry that I talk so fast, but hopefully we'll have lots of questions. This is our Met Houston Methodist Team Hope. The picture's a couple years old, but it's still us, and I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you for your attention. Oh, thank you so much, Rebecca. That, and that's, that's a wonderful um, photo of your team there. We know that um, when we talk about multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary uh, teams, uh, that really makes up quite a few folks that come together to bring a wealth of care and support to people that are diagnosed with ALS and their caregivers during uh, those clinic meetings. So thanks for sharing that image. Uh, we do have a couple questions and comments. Um, and thanks, um, Rebecca, for really kind of providing that high-level overview because, you know, there are a lot of different aspects of relationships that's coming across in some of these um, questions. Uh, the first one is, our adult children live nearby, but how much should we rely on them? They're just starting their careers. You know, that is a difficult ba balance because we as parents, we love our children and we know our role is to launch them into that independence. And and um, we know that they're import it's important for them to be busy in their careers. At the same time, I, I also think we might be robbing them from the joy of being involved in our lives during a time that might be long or it might be short or it might be somewhere in between. So I think the most important thing is to have the conversation with them about what they're comfortable in. Again, back to that accepting support and maybe defining. Um, it, it, it's back to that vulnerability. It might be important to, again, have a conversation, maybe what I call a family meeting, where you just say that these are this is what we're thinking out loud and we want to balance. At the same time, we want to respect and honor and and give you freedom to, to launch your, your um, careers um, at, and let them be involved in the decision making. So maybe there's some boundaries you do have, like you're not going to mm -hmm. quit your job or you're not going to be over at our house 24-7. Um, but at the same time, kind of problem solving together with them what, by, what might be a nice uh, balance of both. Um, I think having private caregivers uh, available when it's needed will free them from that hands-on care that maybe they have to do, but maybe there are some things that they would enjoy doing, um, whether it's in driving people, to, you know, doing the transportation, or even some of our families have had one person that was more tech savvy than someone else, and so they've set up scheduling or, or apps that allow them to uh, manage who helps who at what time, who brings meals maybe once a week. Or uh, if you think about a whole different disease population, people with cancer that are doing chemotherapy will set up uh, places for people who are gonna drive people back and forth to their chemotherapy appointments. And you could do something similar to that where uh, a neighbor or a friend or even that child might be able to free up the time to go to a clinic with them. I know our families love to come to clinic because they learn more about what their loved one is actually going through, you know, what the questions, what the team really looks like. So it's kind of like they get to live it as well. Oh, great. Those are some wonderful ideas. And, um, you know, I'm so glad you mentioned something about getting help when you need it. As a matter of fact, the ALS Association utilizes an online calendar through the ALS Care Connection 
that really um, enables families just to post what their non-medical needs are. And then when their family and friends ask how they can help, they can just look at that calendar and select something that would fit their schedule. And, you know, I think that it's so hard to know when people want to help, and we do know that families and friends want to help, but it's hard to try to figure out just exactly what they can do, what they're capable of or what fits their schedule. But it's nice to have that online calendar because it kind of alleviates the, the burden of care, non-medical care, um, and it also allows them to help, and that's very fulfilling for many folks. Um, we do have another question that just, just came in. How do you counsel patients who now feel, quote unquote, less than before, especially in the relationships they're having with their partner? That's a, that's a great question and a very difficult question. And that's one of the reasons that I think that being open to doing what I call talk therapy, um, I mean, I, I certainly work with our families a lot in the beginning, but that, that often is not enough. Um, because we have to remember that each of us were our people and we're people are, are and, and we all have histories and we all have stories and ALS is part of our story, but it isn't the only part of our story. And so if people come from a place of um, feeling less than or maybe maybe have a history of trauma or a history of parents that weren't there for a lot of different things that create not only those dynamics to be there, but also in our culture. Um, you know, I think men and women both work in the in the uh, work equally th these days, but there's still a lot of what I call traditional mindset in terms of the husband being responsible for the financial and caregiving part of the family. And so when he's the one affected, as I mentioned in my talk, goes from one day being the boss to the next day on disability or feels like they're having to cut their their financial uh, abilities to send children to college or to do things they wanted to do or even just not being able to uh, be the person who does the maintenance on the house or does the things that gave him pleasure that that could have that would affect any of us in not only our egos but our sense of accomplishment and we know that everyone in this world as a human being we need to feel like we have purpose in life and so i often talk to people when i when i do talk to them about considering those aspects and thinking about how you're going to fill that void when you're no longer maybe in the work arena or when you're not fulfilling that role in the family um, but but I think my my ability to do that is limited. And so I think having the ability to go to a counselor on a weekly or bi-weekly mm -hmm. basis or go as a family would be able to address those issues much more uh, uh, consistently over time. Nobody is a bad person because they feel less than, because quite honestly, that's what happens to anyone who has a health issue. It, it isn't I, it isn't specific to ALS. It's anyone who is, has been a functioning individual and has health issues or physical issues that change who what they can accomplish in life. Because quite honestly, our society is set around that we are what we can do. I don't mean that in a bad way, but we are what we can do. And when we can't do, we it's hard for us to feel that we are loved just because we are. Um, and so these are these are really difficult, difficult situations that just can't be fixed overnight. But I think that addressing them and being willing to talk about them as scary as it is might help the person and the person that loves that person into a better, a better place where they can um, they can, like I said, be angry at the disease. Um, so that they can say, look, you know, look what this does to me rather than look who I am no longer. I think that, I hope that makes sense. Oh, I, I think so. I think so. Uh, a comment here. Um, someone really appreciated your framing um, the topic and also the analogy you used with the alphabet, um, which that really makes sense. Sometimes it's just 
really address the things that are kind of uncomfortable and then we can get back to enjoying everything else. Um, so really appreciate that. Uh, and another comment, um, someone likes your comment about fishing. <laughs> so, um, good, good. <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, what, what, what was that again? Uh, uh, it says it's the worst day of fishing is better than the best day at work. And, okay. and some people say it about golfing or other things, but it's just that when we have time off and we have time with our loved ones, it's sure, it's not that we don't love our work, but work is not what we can take in ter long term when we, are, when we are really needing to have the relationships that are important in life. We have relationships at work too, but um, as, we, as we deal with things that are much more um, uh, about our health, we tend to look at our personal relationships and how important they are. Great. And you mentioned relationships. Someone is asking about another relationship we, we don't think about every day, maybe, but um, they asked, can you speak to informing friends or work colleagues about ALS and the journey um, and being able to do that in the way you want to? That's a really good good um, question. Thank you so much for asking it. And actually, I probably should have put it into my talk. Um, so several years ago, we um, we were we were working with a woman who really wanted to educate a lot of people, and and yet she didn't want to make 50 phone calls or or have people you know that she was uh, she didn't want to do it on social media. So I we she helped to draft a letter, and she gave us permission to use it and to share it with others when we took out all the personal information. And it was, in this case, it, it was a letter, but it, she used it as an email. So she was able to email it to people that she were part of her life, but weren't necessarily people that she wanted to sit down and tell the story over and over again. So she was able in the body of the email to say what she was dealing with, that she had a great team, and if people were asking about what they could do for her, these were the things that would be most helpful. And to me, it was really, really, um, she kind of took to, let me just step back a little bit. So one of the talks that I often have with new families is that I say, you know, well-meaning people can say really stupid things. And as much as we know the up-to-date literature and research about ALS, many people still hear the doom and gloom, and many people who Google it see the doom and gloom. And so you'll encounter someone in, this was pre-COVID, of course, in the grocery store or in your church or whatever and either they'll give you that look that says i'm feeling so sad for you or they'll say something like oh i just heard the news i am so sorry about your husband or whatever the conversation is and what i tell people is as much as these people may be wanting to be helpful they're also exhausting you emotionally and we all have only a finite amount of emotional energy every day and so I encourage people to develop what I call scripts or little kind of things that they can say when they get in that moment, they don't necessarily want to share their whole journey with the person they're encountering. It may be something as simple as, thank you, I appreciate your thoughts, I appreciate your prayers, we have a great treatment team, we're really hopeful, I don't really feel like talking about it now. Because what you, if you start talking about it, many times these well-meaning people will then launch into a story about a friend of a friend of a friend who had this disease and had a horrible or good or whatever outcome. But again, you get that what I call vicarious trauma or emotional exhaustion just from listening to the other person's emotions. So by framing that, you can, by having those scripts, you can kind of get out of awkward conversation. And, and this is, and back to my original <laughs> comment was by drafting this email or letter to these friends and acquaintances, you can tell a whole lot of people and you can manage how much or how little you want to tell them. Oh, you know, I am so glad someone submitted that question because that can kind of be a thorny one. Um, you know, letting your, your work 
classmates or colleagues know, um, or even extended friends. Maybe it's at a, a large church or your children's PTA or even a larger neighborhood. But your comments about how to address those well-meaning but somewhat negative comments that we hear from folks. Um, so I really liked the way you were able to provide us with some comments about letting them know that um, we have a, a care plan in place and we're you know, looking forward to, to moving forward with that. Um, so helpful. You know, Cynthia, let me just make one a different addition. When I, th I think there also are education moments and each person has to decide whether emotionally at that moment they have the energy to do that. But in addition to the, the, the script or the comment, it's also a wonderful opportunity if they're comfortable to say, and if you're interested, why don't you join our walk team for the ALSA? Or why don't you, this is the website, you know? So um, I, again, I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm on the, this, this website, but why not use that opportunity to have one more person kind of get on the positive side of, of raising money rather than on the negative side of just um, being sad for me or sad for you. Um, but again, it depends on each person's emotional energy that day. So I, I think people have to uh, um, think about that individually. And, and in, it, in addition to that, I think for the person diagnosed with ALS and their family, how much they tell their employer if they're gonna continue empl employment is really their own personal choice. We have some people who feel very comfortable going back and telling them and the, and the work is right behind them. Other people don't feel quite so comfortable, so they just uh, keep, keep it to themselves for a little while. And I think as hard as that is sometimes, I think it's important to honor each person's individual choice. Absolutely. And, and again, we know this is a progressive disease, so we can anticipate that there will be changes and maybe even account for those as, as the journey unfolds, being able to share additional information or different information um, as applicable in your own journey. Right. Um, another, another question, and thanks so much for, uh, we've got some great robust interaction here this afternoon. Um, this, this comment's not surprising to me. How do I transition back and forth from being the wife to the caregiver to the wife? I'd still like to celebrate Valentine's Day this year. Absolutely. Oh, that, that sounds like it's ripe for creativity. Uh, and I bet you're just the person that could do it, whoever submitted that question. You know, it is really tough, um, but but th I think about roles like um, when I when I was became a mother and I wanted to transition from being the mommy to the wife and and going back from being a caregiver to being a you know emotionally a mutual adult who wanted to be with my husband at the time. So. I would encourage you and anybody who's interested in this question to be creative about it. And as much as you'll be caregiving, maybe uh, say, you know, start now and say, you know, Valentine's Day will be a special day and we're gonna do it this way or, we're, or frame it or design a special little uh, dinner together, even if that person is, is, is on a formula. You can, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole lot to be special if it's special between the two of you. Maybe bring out a picture from when the two of you were married or when you or play the song from when you first dated or something that could be a wonderful connection to who you are over, over a span of time, not just today. We're all emotional creatures and remembering the relationships and why we are together um, will just, you know, it doesn't mean that you won't be a caregiver again in the future, but it makes that moment special. And that's going to be a moment that both of you will remember forever. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, relationships, I probably always need cultivation, regardless of whether ALS is in the picture or not. Absolutely. Um, so I, I think some of your comments are certainly applicable to, to life in general. Um, and uh, here's a here's a great question uh, that probably applies to to lots of folks on the call. 
Our clinic social worker is two hours away. Should we call them for support or find a counselor in our own town? Well, I know what I suggest. I, I certainly couldn't speak for your clinic social worker, but um, I, I try to keep in touch with our families via phone and um, our visits when they do get to visit. But if, if what you're looking for or wanting is a longer, a, a longer relationship with counseling, or weekly basis, then I often will find a therapist in their in that person's area and who takes their insurance. And I will call the therapist. I'll call two or three of them first to make sure it's a good fit, because not every therapist deals with the medical issues or with um, you know with just grief and loss in general. They may be more specific to adolescents or children. So you just don't want to grab anybody because you guys don't have time to interview 10 or 15 different counselors. So I would ask your clinic social worker to help you find someone in your area so that you can develop a relationship over time. They may not be specific to the ALS, but they will be helpful in the relationship building and the support. Very good, thank you, thank you. Um, here's another question that was just submitted and I'm going to read it. Um, verbatim, can you speak a little bit about how patients talk and interact with each other, especially when one is more advanced? You said talk, right? Yes. Okay. Talk and interact with each other, especially when one is more advanced. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to figure out the best way to frame this. So I, I have I have seen some different sessions by different speech pathologists and uh, and counselors and, and something similar to this where they talk about intimacy in the world of disability. And it's really about continuing to have intimate relationships, even in the midst of having a wheelchair involved or a communication device involved. Um, or, or even the, you know, the actual physical intimacy that may be, uh, may be safe, but may be uncomfortable or scary for the people involved to begin with. And, um, you know, I'm fortunate to work at a clinic where our nurse did um, have a, a was a, had a husband who who had ALS, and so she she could talk to those specific uh, physical intimacy issues. But but I also think it's important to talk to each other about how how um, you can you're doing the communication, so you're both comfortable with the level of intimacy that you have. Uh, many people with our communication devices, if they're a Toby or whatever, they'll put in some specific words uh, that are that are private for them that aren't necessarily mm -hmm. going to be used when they're in a public setting. Um, we've had actually people who have voice banked just enough words for a specific term that they gave their loved one and not for every day to day conversation. So it, there's a lot of different ways people have done that. Uh, but I also think that this is an area where your treatment team um, can give you some excellent advice because oftentimes it wouldn't just be come from me. It might come from me and the speech pathologist and the physical therapist and the nurse, you know, who all kind of talk about different aspects of, of physical and, and uh, communication intimacy. Um, I think communication is more than just words. That's why I said that the communication device or a person that has difficulty talking I'm sure each person on this call knows their loved one, if, even if they can't say something with words, will communicate their needs. We all do that. Um, so, um, Cindy, I'm not sure I addressed yeah, so, the question, so maybe. Yeah, the, the, the question was somewhat general, and, and I really appreciate you um, going into detail about how to communicate, particularly with our, you know, our intimate partners, because that can be challenging without any um, disabilities or challenges or distractions, but certainly more so when someone is ill or not feeling well or having to use um, durable medical equipment or communication devices. 
But if you could expand on that relationship, um, because we are talking about relationships in general, um, what about two people with ALS communicating with each other? I know in some um, areas, people kind of have their, 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 what used to be called a pen pal or a buddy or a mentor, uh, maybe talking with someone else who has the disease. Do you have any comments about how people can continue to communicate or continue a relationship between two people that may have ALS? Well, I think you, you you said it, you know, that that's the wonderful thing about technology that that many of our um, individuals who are on communication devices will have uh, wonderful access to their buddies that that they keep in touch with. Um, and I know when I've um, met individuals who are maybe in an area that's not as um, is, is close to having a, a support group or something that they can be involved in. Again, this was pre-COVID, so we weren't as all on, on the virtual platform as we are now. But I would um, often offer to them to release, you know, to get a HIPAA release and uh, in, um, introduce them to each other so that they could become, as you said, ALS buddies, whether it was two women that wanted to communicate that were in the same area, or maybe it was somebody across the country, but they were a similar age um, and certain things that they had in common. Um, because I think the support groups are excellent, but sometimes um, you may live in, live in an area that's not as um, accessible. Again, now that we're on a virtual platform, it's much, much more accessible. But I do think that some people are more private and would like those connections individually rather than in a group. So I think that's a wonderful tool, especially, let's say there's two gentlemen who um, they love their wives very much, but their wives are not dealing with their feeling very locked in. As one gentleman said to me, um, you know, my, my exercise and moving and everything was, was my release. And now I feel like everything's in my head. And um, so finding a release for that, if he, if he found he could release that through whether he did it through social media or he did it through uh, emailing or texting with another gentleman dealing with the same thing, that just feeling of not being alone. And we know whether we're caregivers or the person dealing with the disease, that um, feeling isolated and alone is the worst feeling in the world. Oh, that it is. And I'm ever grateful for the technology that enables people with ALS to continue to communicate, and even more so now when um, the general population is turning to technology to, to maintain our communications. Um, uh, another uh, question, really, to go a little bit deeper into this, and 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 this makes sense. You know, people with ALS, we know it's a progressive disease, but what we don't know is how quickly it's going to progress. And sometimes that presents a challenge. I know even in support groups, uh, there are people there that have a very fast progression disease, and other people that have been going to the support group for years and years and years. Um, do you have any comments that could help people if they're in a relationship or how they can support someone whose disease is not progressing at the same rate that theirs is? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. And it, it is, it is in, interesting, the dynamic of this disease that way. Um, but I, I know I, one gentleman said to me, you know, I, I don't, he says, I don't call it survival guilt, but sometimes I do feel guilty that I've been coming to clinic for all this time and I've said goodbye to so many people. Um, and and it, it, it is unique. I mean, we don't want, we want to feel so happy that we're doing so well and yet we feel so sad that others are not. And, and I think it's important to honor that both of these feelings are valid and real. It's, it's back to that moments of joy and moments of sadness at the same time that uh, each of our journeys is each of our journeys and some of which we have control over and some of which we don't. Um, and nobody on this call asked to have ALS. No one else, nobody caused it. No one's, you know, did something to themselves to make it happen. 
they, it, it, there's no rhyme or reason to why we get different diseases. We, we can say that smoking causes cancer, but in reality, some of us get cancer and some of us don't. I mean, but, but there's this tendency in our world to feel like a cause and effect that every, that we have control over things that many times we don't have control over. It's an illusion. And yet it's what keeps us sane sometimes. So sometimes feeling like there's something I did that is making my disease progress faster and there's something someone else did that theirs is progressing slower. I know it's magical thinking and it makes no sense. At the same time, we're human. And so we have these, we have these thoughts and we have these feelings. And that's why in counseling, the whole idea of what we call cognitive therapy exists is that sometimes we need to say out loud that I know I'm having these feelings, but is there any logic to it? Or is it just a feeling that I'm, I'm feeling sad that this person is progressing faster than me? Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and I think that situation might um, uh, apply to more than just one caller, because um, we have folks on the line here from across the country, and I can see that those types of situations may occur in multiple places. Right. We Absolutely. have really, we've really had a robust engagement here with folks that are on the call, and that's fabulous because this uh, webinar series is de designed to share practical information and then to get that feedback or questions or comments from uh, those that are joining us. So thank you. Um, please do continue. We have a, just a few more minutes left in our reserve time frame, so continue to submit your questions or comments in the chat box. And I can tell you again that the um, entire webinar is recorded and that will be placed on the ALS Association National website, so you can go to that website and click on a, a link to hear the entire webinar over again or to access the slides. You can also reach out to your local ALS Association chapter for additional information similar to the information Rebecca is sharing with us today. Okay, let's see what other questions we have because we are winding down. Really, someone is just submitting a, a appreciation for um, all of the resources that are available uh, to people living with ALS. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that. Um, we want to make sure that resources are available to people, uh, people that are diagnosed and, and their caregivers, because you know, we're talking about relationships this month, and the reality is ALS is not really a diagnosis that's given to someone in a silo. It, it, uh, so significantly impacts the entire family, whatever that family may look like. Um, so we're pleased to be able to bring support and resources for everyone that's living with ALS. Very good. I'm going to make one more call for questions and comments. Very good. In that case, I will thank you again for carving time out in your schedule. I hope that you will join us next month where we will be learning um, information about nutrition in ALS as March is National Nutrition Month. So thank you again, uh, Ms. Axline, for providing this overview and valuable information and details to us. If you have any additional questions, you can reach out to your local chapter or you can reach out to Rebecca directly. Her email address is on the screen. And I extend wishes for a very safe afternoon as you continue on. Thank you so much for joining us and have a good day.